This is the sixth episode of the Space Engineering Podcast with Dr. Kira Abercrombie as a guest who is a professor in the Aerospace Engineering Department at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which is how I know her because she was my professor for many classes and labs. She previously worked at NASA doing ongoing work from her PhD, where her thesis was titled Using Reflectance Spectroscopy to Determine Material Type of Orbital Debris. So in this episode, we go heavy into the space debris environment, so deorbit regulations, difference between space debris and geostationary or GEO versus low Earth orbit LEO orbits, geostationary transfer or GTO rocket bodies, hypervelocity impacts, Whipple shields, space shuttle windows, then we go into space environments, so solar radiation, ultraviolet light, Earth's magnetic field protection from radiation, atomic oxygen in our atmosphere, especially in the upper atmosphere, and the synergistic effects between atomic oxygen and ultraviolet light, and micrometeoroid impacts and flux. Then we get into Earth-based observations, so the difference between radar observations and radar telescopes and optical telescopes, and also in-space observations, so observing debris from a spacecraft in space, and a bunch of her experiences getting to work at different telescopes around the world. So some orbit determination methods. So once you have those observations, you have either position vectors and range and range rate, or you have angles only, so how to do orbit determination with different types of data. Then we get into NASA orbit modeling software where she provided inputs into that. So those pieces of software were called Evolve and Ordem 96. A little bit into anti-satellite or ASAT tests effects on orbital debris. There's one case where she did where she was looking at GPS satellite solar panel debris using spectroscopy from Earth. And then going deeper into details of spectroscopy for identification of orbital debris material. So how atmospheric water interferes with infrared wavelengths. There was an Odorax mission that dropped off a bunch of spheres that a bunch of scientists used in order to be able to calibrate their instruments from observations in space. Glare effects on observations, electromagnetic spectrum regions to be able to identify different materials, Apollo rocket body observations to observe the titanium oxide paint, and the space environment effects on materials over time. And then we end with what it's like and what was her experience doing her PhD and some advice to anyone who's looking, who's thinking about doing a PhD and then also why she became a professor at Cal Poly SLO. So could you start about just giving a little bit of background as kind of the work that you did in your PhD, then you mm -hmm. went on to the ESC group slash the NASA Johnson Center and then becoming a professor at Cal Poly? Yeah, it's a, it's a long history. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting when you get older because you start to think of things in groups of decades and then you realize the work you were doing is two, <laughs> three decades ago and it starts to seem quite odd. But um, yeah, I, I was an astrophysics major at UCLA and then tried to get into astronomy PhD programs and uh, grade point and everything wasn't quite where it needed to be to compete at that level. Um, and I just, I just wasn't gonna be able to get in. Um, and someone suggested, hey, why don't you try aerospace? And I said, well, if I can't get into astrophysics, how am I gonna get into aerospace? Um, but I went over and I talked to some people and they conditionally let me into the, the PhD program and it was the best decision ever. Like it, I finally found my niche, my thing, and everything just kind of ramped away from there. I got involved with this professor, um, Dr. Robert Kolb, who was doing space debris, and I was able to kind of marry what I really liked about astrophysics, which was the um, observing and the astronomy aspect of it with something that I could actually see and touch and feel, which was spacecraft. And so um, it was a perfect, uh, I, couldn't have, I couldn't have imagined a better thesis topic for me. Um, so I researched basically trying to figure out what materials are of orbiting objects in order to potentially shield better or observe better in the future for those objects. So we look at spectroscopy, which is just the way light um, gets absorbed uh, by different materials. So from there, I got a job at Johnson Space Center as a postdoc, um, which basically I continued my research down there and then got some great opportunities to go to different observatories around the world, down in Chile and out to Maui, and it was phenomenal. And, um, and then I got hired on as a contractor and stayed there till 2008 and then got hired at Cal Poly uh, to, to teach out here. And that was a great move too. So I've been really fortunate in all the way my, my jobs have kind of lined up mm -hmm. for sure. 
So could we start getting into kind of the space debris environment and kind of why it's becoming an increasingly larger problem? <laughs> right. Well, um, it's it's really interesting because when it first, it's a relatively new field, you know, I mean, it's how we started launching human and made objects and um, it, it it wasn't even a thing and it wasn't even a thing until they realized um, during the shuttle, they were starting to get hits on the wind, on the windshield. And um, that's bad, right? And so if you get a hole in your spacecraft, it, it means that all the oxygen that's inside the spacecraft will eventually go out of the spacecraft and that's not really what you want. So um, there in light this started this field and with just paint flakes hitting hitting windscreens our windshields and it's now blossomed into this huge field you know when i first started there was probably 200 of us worldwide that were studying and now it's it's everywhere because we're not we when i was at, at nasa we were looking at assuming there were going to be 75 launches a year right and that was when you would put one payload maybe two payloads on a, a one launch right so you'd get 75 new objects in space plus some rocket bodies in space and now I mean if you look at say there was an Indian launch earlier last year they put up 120 objects on one launch mm -hmm. and that just means that's that many more you have to keep track of when they die that's that many more you we've got to look at for space debris so it's just this problem is just going to continue to build upon itself um, and so it, it's something that everybody that, and we, we talked about it in, in school, you know, you got to learn how to play nice in the sandbox. And right now we're, our sandbox is getting pretty crowded with toys. Yeah. So then can we get into kind of the requirements? Well, I guess at least in the U S but I'm guessing there's also like international, or I guess each country has their own requirements, but kind of a deorbiting plan for, if you're going to send something up, you have to have a plan to, for it to come back down. Right. And what's interesting is there is actually um, worldwide agreed upon rules. Okay. So we have a group called the Interagency Debris Coordination Committee, and those are representatives from all over the world that come together and try and decide on as a group what these rules should be for mitigation. And then it's adopted by the UN and it's through the UN and um, peaceful uses of outer space, which is a really cool title. I think. <laughs> but and so every country that launches vehicles is supposed or launches spacecraft is supposed to follow these rules. So the rules really are in low Earth orbit, which is about 2000 kilometers in altitude and lower. You're supposed to do something with your vehicle, with your spacecraft, uh, rocket bodies, anything within 25 years of the completion of its um, its usefulness or its activity. So um, if your spacecraft is active for five years, then 25 years from the end of that time, you have to either deorbit it or you have to do something that's going to make it in 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 the orbits in between Leo and Geo, you'd have to push it up into a certain altitude. So you have to do something with it. The problem is that's a really long time, right? And if you think about your career or my career, people are in these careers for 30 years, right? So you're talking about, there's no policing that we can do really in this useful lifetime. So it's, it's really, as I mentioned before, playing nice in the sandbox. Like we want everyone to be able to actively participate. So in order to do that, we need to get rid of the stuff that's not an active spacecraft. There's different rules when you're higher up because you can't naturally deorbit objects that are at the uh, geo regime, which is really high, 36,000 kilometers up off the surface. So they have to push it up higher and make it into what's called a graveyard orbit, about 300 kilometers higher. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, are the regulations, because as far as, you know, a lot of people can send up CubeSats to LEO, but then I'm guessing that the regulations would be a bit tighter for GEO because it's kind of restricted since if you want to be geostationary, it's just one area where you can be, <laughs> where as far as LEO, there's a bunch of inclinations that you can be. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, well, so I guess, can you talk about the differences between the debris field and LEO versus GEO? Well, you hit on it right, right there by saying all the different inclinations and altitudes that you can be at in LEO means that there's debris all over. And when things come out, it, it now can get perturbed into an orbit that's everywhere. So in LEO, you kind of have debris coming at you in a bunch of different directions. Whereas in GEO, it's all really in that same line. And so if you leave something dead in the active geo belt, 
that's really bad because it's not being corrected to stay in its little slot like everything else. Everything in geo has a very specific spot it needs to stay at. And so because of that, when debris is in geo, it's really even harder. As it propagates through, it's going to get out of the real tight geo band, but you don't want to have to maneuver away like you do in Leo away from objects. So there's a lot fewer debris in, in geo, fewer pieces because there's fewer objects and fewer launches. It's, it's more expensive to get out to geo. Um, but we also then move up because the deorbiting aspect. So they put all the dead rocket bodies and dead spacecraft up in this graveyard orbit because of that. So the speeds are different too. That's the other big difference because you're moving seven kilometers a second and those impacts of a direct collision in LEO is 14 kilometers per second mm -hmm. rather than in GEO, it's three kilometers a second. And we, ca we call it in the field kind of a glancing blow in GEO where really what you get is a debris hitting you going like this instead mm -hmm. of a direct collision. Wait, for the, the geostationary transfer rocket bodies, mm -hmm. do those, what are the requirements for those? I mean, because they're really elliptical. So do they, do they have requirements of burning up or graveyard orbit? Yeah, that's a great question. So it really depends on the semi-major axes. So it's the halfway point, right? If you remember, so the Leo to Geo, you take those um, or the closest point to the earth and the farthest away point in the earth, add those together and divide by two. But that number is, it puts them in that category. So some of those objects can deorbit on their own after 25 years because they spend so much time in low earth orbit and it'll drag it down, but it takes a long time. The others will move into a graveyard orbit eventually in Leo and Geo. And then the other real problem is, is that a lot of those are up there before these regulations and rules came into place and they're just going to be there forever. And there's, there's violators like a, a, an upper stage Delta you know, we just know it's violating and we accept it's violating and move on because there's not a lot you can do. Right. I can't go up there and just pull it down myself. <laughs> yeah, that'd be expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So can we talk about the relative kind of the hypervelocity impacts and kind of what yeah. that means for creating new debris? Because materials, when they're going, you know, kilometers, that many kilometers per second relative to each other and the impact, they can vaporize. So kind of like the amount of energy that's involved and kind of what happens in those events. Yeah, you know, it's re if, if you step back from the awfulness of a collision, right, if you can just look at the science of a collision, it's really super cool, because what happens is they're moving so fast, and that kinetic energy on that impact is so much that what happens is it can turn a solid metal into a liquid for moments, and you get these really cool structures from impacts that look like, and I always uh, um, try and use this in class, it, you've seen those videos where it milk drops and they do a slow motion, it creates this amazing crown of milk that gets, and that's what happens with the objects in space. They get this crater that has, because the metal has been, you know, liquidified at that point because of the heat and that and the impact, that it makes this crown effect and you get these really cool um, impacts. Now, the problem is, is if it's however thick that shield is based on the diameter of the object, you can have different things because there's a shock wave and a, a compression wave and a tension wave that's going through. And so what happens is where those meet, you can either vaporize the particle or it makes a cookie cutter kind of hole through the shield if it's if the shielding's not thick enough. And so these impacts are unbelievably complicated in order to model. But really what they're trying to do is in order to save the spacecraft, you got to have a shield that's thick enough to stop the particle or vaporize the particle and then or <laughs> move out of the way. <laughs> but you don't want to make your shield so thick that you can't fly it because mass is everything in space. So you have to kind of figure out some shielding techniques that will work. And and in Leo, they shield spacecraft. In Geo, there's no shielding, really. Mm -hmm. So can we go into the shields then? That one sure. strategy would be the, the Whipple shields. Can you kind of go over how those work? I think those are pretty interesting and not very like intuitive, I guess, initially. Yeah, you know what? They came up from tanks in, in World War II. And so really what they were looking at is trying, how are they, can they shield tanks? And so they'd put this 
layer of aluminum or metal in front of and leave some air space in between that and the tank to try and allow for particles to slow down and and so that they could impact and not and not crack through and so when we were building shields for spacecraft this whipple shield idea was already there in tanks and they thought well that actually is great for spacecraft because what it does is you have a thin layer of metal, you might fill it. Those are called stuff Whipple shields, where, or it has air. So either you fill it with material, you fill it with air, and then you have some distance and you have another layer. And what it allows it to do is it disrupts the speed of that prop projectile. As it comes through that first layer, it slows it down enough that it can just impact and not make that cookie cutter and go all the way through. Um, so there's a bunch of really cool shield designs on putting through like Kevlar in the middle or something like that, that could stop the material. So if basically all you're trying to do is slow down the speed so that it doesn't get to that high. So it's no longer a hyper velocity impact that it's a speed that the, that the shield can handle. And that's a trade of mass, right? Because like, say you can put like a lead wall around your spacecraft and that <laughs> just be heavy and you're losing mass. Right. Um, so is the point, it's just kind of something that I've been thinking about. Like, is the point of having that initial layer of Whipple shield that it takes a lot of energy to completely break a metal or put a hole in a metal to break all the bonds versus causing a dent in a thick material? Or Correct. Is that kind of, okay. It's a mass issue, right? And so what we look at is we might be willing to sacrifice that first layer in order to have a mass, because otherwise you have to have a huge thickness of, of metal and we can't fly that. That's mm -hmm. in, impossible to fly. And so what they've done is really looked at, okay, what could we do with, how do we slow down the particle? And, and we can, like we said, sacrifice that first layer in order to know it's not gonna penetrate all the way to the surface. And so the, the Whipple shield idea is to lose mass, but still be effective. So on the space shuttle windows, I guess, do they have some idea before they went up or was there, they consider like maybe some redesigns of how do we reinforce like still having windows in the shuttle now that we've seen that we're getting impacted regularly? Well, they do have three layers of windows okay. on the shuttle and the station. And so, but that was, as far as I know, that was not a debris thing. That was a pressure problem. You know, they were, it's, it's a window with an edge and, um, you know, but the, probably the engineers didn't want to put windows in it at all, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but you have a psychological effect of, of needing some windows. So they do have three layers, but the idea is that they, I don't think as far as the story is that I've been told is they were not expecting to be hit by paint flakes. You know, mm -hmm. that was not on their radar as things were coming off. And it kind of makes sense. You know, when we were designing the shuttle, we were launching the kind of things that we were launching and people weren't, didn't know much about the space environment. And so they would just paint the outside of a spacecraft with white paint, you know, we need it white because we need some thermal control. And that material gets really brittle in space and can just flake off. And so suddenly that thing is going the same speed as the spacecraft, but maybe in the opposite direction because it's been perturbed. And so now you have a paint flake that's coming at you and it's not dissimilar to when you're driving down the freeway and a rock flies up from the tire of the one in front of you and smacks your windshield. And then you have a nice little crack in your windshield and then you watch it like propagate. Yeah. However, we're not sitting in an environment where it's pressurized and all the oxygen we need it's disconcerting when you're driving your car and you get this crack across your windshield. Can you imagine you see a little hole in your window on the space station and then suddenly you know that's the difference between you and breathing? <laughs> that, that, that probably raises your heart rate a little bit. So um, yeah, so that's the story that I was told when I first started is that the, the shuttle came back and they were like, what is this stuff? And they did tape lifts. So they, they go out and examine the shuttle and they would do, they put tape over the holes and they lift out to try and determine what it was. And when they saw it was white paint, they're like, we might, thus there starts my career of, of mm -hmm. space debris and space junk because we needed to figure out what was happening. So just real quick on the Whipple shield. So say <laughs> your Whipple shield works on one impact and then now there's a hole in the first layer of shield. <laughs> Right. Are you, you're kind of just counting on the fact that these are so unlikely anyways that it's, a debris wouldn't hit the same spot and just go through and onto the next layer? 
Yeah, statistically, that's pretty, that would be pretty incredible for it to hit the exact same spot again. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, as much as this happens quite a bit, um, the, the likelihood of exact same spot is astronomical as far okay. as percentages. If you do, though, um, they will replace the outer edges of some of those shielding or blanket material if it's starting to look um, too, you know, so they'll go out on a, on a space walk and replace that kind of material on the station and, and on the shuttle, we would replace it when it would come back down in the Hubble, they do the same thing. We, they replace outer edges of the material for space environmental effects as well as debris impacts. Mm -hmm. um, other objects, as you know, you can't go up in service. So um, they have to be, they have to think about what they're gonna do in that case. So can we go on now to the just other spacecraft environment? Cause debris is just <laughs> one thing but then there's like the atmosphere, atomic oxygen, let's see, solar radiation, charge electrical right. charge. So yeah, can you talk a little bit about that kind of all the things that spacecraft have to mitigate for? Sure. I mean, it is a volatile place. Um, aside from the fact that one you, that you didn't mention is you have to survive the launch, which is, mm -hmm. you know, if you can't survive the launch, you don't get to have to the spacecraft anyway, but that's not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, so once you're in orbit, um, and we'll start with low Earth orbit because it has all the perturbational effects. Um, so the, the first thing you have is, and everyone talks about there being nothing in, in low Earth orbit. I think that's easier for people to understand, but there actually are particles in this environment. There's just fewer of them. And so what is the, the main constituent of that environment is actually O2, um, so oxygen. Um, and what happens is it interacts with... Um, the UV coming from the sun, so the ultraviolet light coming from the sun. And what that does is it actually, that interaction, it what says what we call disassociate. So it basically splits the um, O2 into an O and an O. Mm -hmm. And so that's called now monatomic oxygen. And instead of saying monatomic oxygen all the time, we say atomic oxygen. So the atomic oxygen is a, a UV disassociated oxygen molecule. And so what happens is that is really corrosive. That atomic oxygen is really corrosive for the external spacecraft um, materials. And certain materials react to it differently than others. And so one of the studies that we do at Cal Poly is we have an atomic oxygen chamber that recreates this atomic oxygen and we put materials in there and we expose it to atomic oxygen to see how it's going to react. And so what you can sometimes see is a darkening of materials um, through atomic oxygen, so it'll change its material properties. So it'll go from being pristine white to kind of looking like a brownish color. Um, we have a not great name for it, but it's called a like we call it a nicotine stain because it looks <laughs> like if you've ever seen the back part of a cigarette, it gets where it's white and then it has that brown kind of color from it from the nicotine. That's the color that some of these materials will get when they turn white due to atomic oxygen. And UV exposure, it does, UV does the same thing to spacecraft that it does to our body. You know, it changes the surface color and, and messes up our skin. It does the same thing to spacecraft. So atomic oxygen and the ultraviolet um, are disruptive for materials. So that's one effect. Um, we have those particles also um, impinge the spacecraft to kind of slow it down. So it has a drag effect, bringing it lower in altitude. Um, we also have solar radiation pressure. So the sun is actually putting out particles like we talked about, and those particles are doing a momentum exchange on our spacecraft. And so it can move your spacecraft from one place to another. We also have um, plasma, which is um, the fourth state of matter, <laughs> if you're going through the states. Uh, and that plasma can because of that plasma, you get uh, particles with different charged particles around your spacecraft. And we actually have a similar phenomenon on Earth, but not with plasma, but the idea of when you get an arc, when you touch something and you get shocked, mm -hmm. that's the same kind of phenomenon that can happen in more often in GEO than in LEO, and you can get a, a spark on your spacecraft. Now, when you get it on your car, it hurts, and everyone goes, oh, I just got shocked, right? Well, when that happens on orbit, what happens is the computer says, ow, oh, I just got shocked. <laughs> and either the computer stops working or you have to do something in the computer to reset it so that it can continue to work, depending on how bad the shock is. Um, and then a final one we have is radiation. So you have radiation from the sun. It's coming in different kinds of particle types. 
And then you have radiation from the galaxy that's that's coming into. So those are galactic cosmic rays. So between those sets of radiation, they can actually come through metals and they can mess up electronics on spacecraft. They can um, mess up human bodies um, if you have humans on board. So we try and shield not only for the debris, but for also radi regular radiation. So from the sun's radiation, is it UV or other types that are most harmful to the spacecraft? Because I know um, a big, there's a measure of the estimated solar hours. So is <laughs> it kind of one or the other or just kind of all of them are not great? So it depends on this, what part you're talking about. So this, for the surface properties, it's the UV and that's, and they do calculate it with estimated solar hours because that's the amount of time in the sun, basically, you know? And so you probably do that when you go out in the sun too. People are like, oh, I got to reapply my sunscreen because I've been out here for, for two hours. Or if you're like me, you forget to reapply your sunscreen and then you, and then you burn, right? <laughs> so um, same thing with a spacecraft, you know, if, if we're looking at some sort of shielding, we have to look at the beginning of life and the end of life and how we expect that to, to react to the external surfaces. The radiation that other parts of radiation that the sun puts out that's at different energy level than the UV, alpha and beta and gamma radiation sources, all of those have different wavelengths. And so they can actually come through the shielding. They don't necessarily, they can get blocked by the shielding, but they can also come through that shielding. And so because of that, you have to make sure you know what kind of radiation your spacecraft is expecting and shield appropriately. So does the Earth's magnetic field still shield a little bit from that type of radiation and the galactic cosmic rays when in LEO versus GEO, or does that help at all? It does, it helps a ton. So what okay. it does is it collects those charged particles in the magnetic field lines. So if you're inside and we talk about it, you know, you've heard probably heard of the Van Allen radiation belts, right? So that's the belts that are around um, the earth that are collecting these particles. So when you're inside one of those belts, people often call it the Goldilocks region because you're not as impacted by those particles because you're getting shielded by it with the magnetic field lines. However, there's many spacecraft that are um, polar spacecraft, which means they're going over the poles. So because of that, that's where those magnetic field lines collect. And so because of that, you're going through those collection zones, basically, each orbit. So those spacecraft do have to keep track of what's happening um, with those objects. People that are inside, like Space Station, it's inside one of those belts and doesn't go up very high. Its inclination is about 52 degrees. So it gets to stay in that regime and with purpose. Um, but they do have radiation kind of... I don't want to say bunker because it makes it sound very atomic bomb kind of radiation, but it's this idea is the same. They have a place and they have a plan in place for where astronauts need to go if they feel like this the radiation counts are too high or a galactic cosmic storm or a solar storm or something like that. They have a place where they can go if they get enough warning. So I'm wondering if we can get into more of the spacecraft, the degradation of the material. So sure. the... I forget if you said it was confirmed or people, or it's not confirmed, but the possible synergistic effect between the atomic oxygen and the UV. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the darkening of the materials are also kind of degrading the layer. Um, yeah, it absolutely is confirmed. So they had a okay. mission called um, LDEF, which is the Long Duration Exposure Facility. It is, was a cool spacecraft to determine material impact with the environment. And so what they did is they, it was a cylinder spacecraft and they flew it in an attitude orientation that one side of it saw atomic oxygen and solar radiation and the backside only saw solar radiation. So they put the same materials on both sides so they could see and it spent the same exact amount of time on orbit. And so what they could see is that what, this one on the front had both this one on the back only had one, and so they could see the differences, and there's absolutely a synergistic effect between atomic oxygen and what they saw. Interestingly, is that atomic oxygen would erode a layer, the UV would darken it, atomic oxygen would erode it, UV would darken it, and it was just the synergistic part. So what they saw was some of those samples looked pristine initially when it came back nice and white and the backside ones were really dark because of that with that nicotine stain color and what they saw was the atomic oxygen was eroding that darkness but there was a lot more erosion there wasn't 
the same kind of erosion on the back. It was just a darkening of the material. The layers were all still there. But the front side, although it looked white, was um, the mass loss was huge on the front side. So on that point, wondering about like when a spacecraft, if you know it's going to have a ram side and a not ram side, like the International yeah. Space Station. So in that case, is there considerable more shielding on the ram side versus the other sides? And yes. I guess, <laughs> is there a risk? There's not really much risk at all of getting hit on the non-RAM side, right? Or very well, small. With, with debris, there's not. And it, and in, it, there's less. Let's just put it that way, because I don't want to say there's no risk, because then instantly someone will come with a, but there's a risk on this one. So the RAM side, so the what RAM is, you know, the velocity vector direction, that has definitely more debris that's going to hit you. The reason why is there's this wake that comes behind, and it kind of is a you can think of that as a protective cocoon. As it pushes the air around you, you get kind of this wave behind you. It's a similar thing that happens in a car, right? There's, as wind comes up around you, you hit your car, it recombines somewhere behind you on the car. And that's why some cars are shaped differently on the backside and things like that. Spacecraft are the same way. The, the, the space station has a different problem than almost every other spacecraft. And that's because it is just as tall as it is wide as it is long it's a big huge box almost you know and so it is the biggest thing we've ever created other spacecraft like hubble it doesn't have this the same problem as station as as having issues on the surfaces that aren't necessarily ram facing because of that but so let me go back to the the ram facing is definitely going to have more of the impacts it's going to have more atomic oxygen because that's the direction it's flying it's hitting those particles than the, than the wake direction. And so you can, you often shield in that ram direction more often. Now, the problem is, is depending on what, how your spacecraft is oriented, is that ram direction of your spacecraft the same all the time? And that's where station gets into a problem because that's not true as much anymore. They often have to rotate the spacecraft for visiting vehicles. Um, and so their ram direction gets a little bit convoluted because of the way they have to fly for different parts of the mission. Scientific missions sometimes change what the RAM direction is. And then you have to think about lifetime, right? So station's been up there for so long. It's had the shield being replaced. Other spacecraft, you know, they're in LEO, you're probably talking five years. So if you look at it, there's a statistical model you can run. Like, what do you think you're going to get impacted with debris? And you can make a decision and it's, it's kind of a, a game, you know, you could say, okay, do I, do I want to carry this much more mass to shield the, what I think is going to be the ram direction of my spacecraft, or am I willing to take it statistically and say, I'm only going to be active for five years. I'm probably not going to get hit because my surface area is so small and space is so big. Can you do something similar to kind of just make a st statistical argument for micrometeoroid impacts? Like how, like what is the flux of them? And it's probably like, it's kind of random and it can come from any direction, so. <laughs> yeah, and you, yeah. and you do, again, remembering that th space is this 3D space and you're talking about a surface area in this huge 3D space that might be on the order of a couple meters in length. So it's, it's sometimes, the statistics on it makes it, you add up the, the amount or the flux of potentially of micrometeoroids and also of space debris, human-made space debris, and then combining all of those together with your area and the time, it can give you a probability of impact. And then what you have to look at is the probability of impact versus the cost of shielding. And that's where the, the it happens. And that's why GEO doesn't shield because their probability of impact is way less, even though their area is a little bigger and their time on orbit is bigger. And so they've all done that world. They'll take the hit if, if they get a hit in their spacecraft. The ones that can't do that as much and have hot better, I wouldn't say better, that's a bad choice. In my opinion, better, <laughs> but <laughs> is when humans are on board, right? Mm -hmm. Because taking the hit when a human is on board is a much bigger deal than taking a hit when it's electronics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to move on to observation part of the space yeah. debris. Um, yeah, so there's the radar part of it, and then there's the optical. So can we first just go over, in general, how radar works and kind of how you can 
observe that something is up there with radar? Right. So um, I'll start with, I'm not a radar expert. So if anybody who's a radar expert is listening, they might want to cover their ears as I uh, generalize a radar system right here. But basically what radar does is it sends a signal up. It looks at how the signal gets bounced off of that piece, that object, and comes back to a receiver. And so it does this with how that signal shifts over a period of time. It can figure out where it is, how fast it's moving based on its, its down signal. So you get what's called a range, you get a range rate. And with those two things and multiple observations as it goes over your head, you can determine an orbit from there. And so what you have to have for radar is you have to have the radar that sends the signal and at some place else but co-located, you have to have the receiver dish. So radar has two different sites that it has to be operating at that point. And so radar has great advantages to the fact that it doesn't care what the weather's like. It doesn't care whether it's day or it's night because it's just shooting beams up and getting return signals back down. Okay, so then from the radar, so does the range rate come from multiple observations? Like they can get two position vectors from that get velocity or it's from the actual observation of radar so it gets it, it gets refined from the multiple observations but you okay. you do get a range rate from a single observation now it okay. might not be great and so that's why we try and get at least three observations of a pass before you develop an orbit from that um, and so all of that goes in to try and help figure out a better defining and, and I'll say it this way. So if you think about an orbit, um, we call it how much of the orbital arc do you get to see? So if you have a circle going all the way around you, if you only look at one 80th of that circle, it looks almost like a straight line at that point. You need more of the curvature in order to be able to determine the orbit and more importantly, the velocity vector. Um, that's the real hard part in observations is getting that velocity vector. So radar is better at getting the velocity vector because they get the range rate information. Um, optical observations don't get that. And so it, you can only get the rate based on more of the orbital arc and seeing how the position is changing. And then you can get the rate at which it's changing based on that. Can you also talk a little bit about the, the different modes the stair versus track mode and kind of when one is used for yeah. identifying objects? So if you know more about the orbit, you can stare and, and, and stare and track it. And so you'd be, you, you focus on a certain spot of the sky and you stay on that spot of the sky and you track at the rate you think this, the spacecraft or object that you're observing is moving. A, a random just survey of the sky means it's just sending the radar signal or you're looking at the optical signal both and it's just sending things. It doesn't even know what it's trying to hit. It's just going, okay, I'm gonna look all over and see what comes back. And so at that rate, it's not tracking an individual object, it's scanning the sky. Mm -hmm. So that's more of a scan maneuver where you're just trying to see what's up here rather than tracking. How much, how much better of a estimate of the orbit can you get when say you just have stare and you see something like, oh, there's a thing versus we expect this pass and given that we're gonna track it. So how much can that refine an, an estimate of an orbit? A lot, because if you get to stay with it for a longer period of time, right? So if you're just staring up into space and you see something go through, even if it's a streak, so, you maybe don't know which way it was traveling in that picture that you saw it because you don't get the end two endpoints, right? And so what you really need to know, was it here and then was it here? Or if I only just get one, even if I get the endpoints, I don't know where it was in the next frame. I don't know if it was moving to the right or it was moving to the left because I only got it in one frame. So what usually happens with um, like, not tracking. So if you're just staring at a spark part in the sky is you have a much wider field of view so that you can get beginning and end streaks of objects and try and put together a, an orbit based on that. And if you're tracking though, you get much more of the orbital arc because you're following the spacecraft, you're following at which its rate is. You can tell if the rate's wrong 
because the next picture, it's not where you think it's supposed to be. It's a little bit ahead or a little bit behind. And so you can adjust the rate this, the telescope is tracking based on that. So can we, I think, go back a little bit because I forgot yeah. to ask about in general how optical works, like the difference there's radar oh, and there's yeah. optical I, observations. I jumped <laughs> as well. <laughs> so yeah, so for optical, what you're doing is you're looking, spacecraft don't put out their own energy. Right, so there's no light that's coming from this visible light that's coming from the spacecraft. So you have to completely depend on the sun's light and seeing the reflected light off of the spacecraft. So because of that, if you're gonna observe on a low earth orbit object, on a LEO object, you have to have the right orientation of where the sun is compared to where the observer is in the spacecraft. So that usually is about two hours after sunset so that the orientation is right. Otherwise, what happens is the spacecraft might be overhead, but the, the sun's too far away and you're not getting any reflective light off of it. So the paths could be there, but you don't have any light. Same thing with two hours right before the sun rises, the orientation is right. For geo objects, higher objects that are much higher, you can observe all throughout the night because you can see the sun because they're so much higher. You can't see them with your naked eye like you can a Leo object. Um, but you but you can observe all through the night for geos. And so basically what you're looking at is reflected light. And so you um, we have to be able to see the spacecraft. So there's our disadvantage is we have to observe at those specific times, either night or just the beginning or just at the end. And you have to have clear weather because if there's a cloud in the sky, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. And then for also the, the part about kind of the stair mode of optical being you're rotating as the stars are moving. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if I remember correctly that there's both that you can just stare with optical or you can also do that rotation. Yes. Is that, yes, you can do both. Yeah, so you can do a survey mode where you're just kind of staring and sometimes what we do is stare at a specific and we, um, depending on what kind of object you're trying to track. So if you're trying to look for geo objects, you set the telescope to move at the geo rate, which is similar to the rotation of the earth, right? Um, and so you set at those and what you then get though is the stars are moving at a slightly different rate than, than that. So you get tiny little streaks for the stars, but the spacecraft come up as dots. And so you'll just see a little dot move across the sky or across your frame, not across the sky. On LEOs, because they're moving so fast, we can't track at the LEO speed. Like you're, you couldn't, you, I mean, let me rephrase that. You can, but you just have to know a lot more about that orbit. So for a survey mode in LEO, we usually try and have a wide enough field of view that you get the beginning and end of a streak and you get the beginning and end of a streak so you can kind of start to see which way it's going. And then after that, you can try and track it where you set up where you think it's going to be and you get a frame here and then you move down its path, you get another frame, you move down its path and get another frame. Is so, there... Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, explain that well. No, no, yeah, you did. Um, so is it uncertainty from, say, the... I'm guessing that there would be a gyroscope in these telescopes as they're moving across, and then they have a really good idea as far as where they are with respect to the center of the earth as it's rotating, and then good knowledge of how the earth is rotating. So is that uncertainty kind of minimized or not, what's the word, like not relevant, or that you can disregard it with respect to the uncertainty that you get from the actual optical or the radar observations? Yeah, so really the main source of location of both radar and optical observations for the orbit stems from the fact we don't see it for a long enough period of time. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple velocity vectors that you could get that make sense for the set of observations that you have. So it could be that the velocity vector is pointed this way or it's pointed this way because you only have three spots in a really short part of the orbital arc. So that's really where the uncertainty comes from. Not from, we know pretty well where the, really well now with GPS, we know really well where the telescope is located. Um, we know really well where the telescope is pointed because we have information about all the stars in the sky and we can set that correctly before we start. We know really well, pretty well on the timing of how long it takes to do each exposure, how fast the earth is moving, all of that stuff we know relatively well. What's much harder is to figure out the velocity vector of the orbit because you only get a small part of the orbital arc. 
for the optical, I'm wondering kind of where the limits come from as far as, because there's some objects that can be tracked that are, if I remember correctly, like t on the order of like 10 centimeters. Yeah. Um, so kind of, yeah, is there a trade between kind of field of view that you give a telescope for optical and then the pixel size that they get? Um, yeah, and as far as some, are some telescopes more made for, let's get the really small ones versus let's get a wild or a wide kind of, let's see a lot of objects? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Every, I mean, uh, everything in aerospace is a trade, right? Mm -hmm. And we kind of start to joke about it early on in our students' lifetimes, but <laughs> we, it's absolutely true. So exactly what, what you said, there's a trade in telescope size versus um, how much light you're collecting and then how long your exposure can be. So that's mm -hmm. all for optical, right? So the bigger your telescope is, the fainter object you can see. But because some things are actually pretty bright, like human-made objects are so much closer than those stars, they're going to be brighter even though they're smaller. And so you have to kind of trade how long you leave the camera open to take an exposure because you'll overexpose big stars and those stars are coming you know, every often and then it just ruins your frame. So even if you're searching for small things and you have a really large telescope, there's still a trade with exposure time for overexposure. So right now on, on the LEO objects, radar can see quite a bit um, smaller, possibly more accurately on orbit wise. Um, they are, the catalog is complete so they can see every object that's greater than 10 centimeters, which is about the size of an orange. Uh, California orange, or, you know, <laughs> a good size orange. Yeah. Um, and they can see down to about two centimeters. So that's ridiculous. <laughs> if you think about yeah. it, there's, you know, that's the, that's a little less than an inch. And they can see that something that is 300, 400 kilometers away. I mean, that, it, it's just crazy to me when I start to think about the numbers. But they can't see it often enough to get an orbit accurately. And so, they, like I said, they can see down that far but the orbital accuracy isn't enough because you don't see it as many frames because it, it will rotate and you lose the light or you, you lose the radar signal on it. In geo, we can see down to one meter, um, which is still phenomenal when you think about it as far as um, how far away that is. And you know, a meter is just a yardstick, right? It's just, that's it, <laughs> three feet. And that's amazing that you can see that and that's 36,000 kilometers away. So that's, that's crazy. Um, they use radar more often in, in LEO, uh, but it's a lot more expensive to use a radar up in GEO. So GEO is almost extensively done with optical observations where radar is more often um, done with uh, radar. Is there some of the observatories that you like really like visiting? Or because I said you've seen a lot of them. So are there some good stories of which ones <laughs> were interesting to visit? Yeah. So. Um, I, it's so funny because this is where you start to realize your, you know, the, the the idea of being a nerd. It it kind of just fills you up inside because the fact that I have favorite telescope locations makes mm -hmm. me smile, you know. <laughs> but I have, in particular, um, I had the opportunity when I worked at NASA to go uh, down to Sierra Tololo in in Chile, and that observatory just in general is phenomenal. Um, it is so interesting to because you live there on top of the mountain for however long your observatory time will be. And it's amazing the community that comes together because you're all in your individual telescopes as you're observing for the night because there's, I don't know, I think 10 telescopes on top of that, that system. And so you're in this room by yourself the whole time. So right before sunset, everybody comes out with their cup of coffee and, you know, you kind of have this community sitting there. And I really liked that aspect. It, it made it feel more like family just going to their individual rooms <laughs> for a little bit at night rather than being up there by yourself the whole time um and plus it's beautiful out there you know it's just uh, you know sitting just out outside in these huge mountain ranges and you know the andes and it's just uh, it's just gorgeous another one of my favorite telescopes is on uh, maui up on top of haleakala and that it, those are all military based telescopes. If everyone's ever been up to the top of Haleakala, you can go up to the visiting center and you can see the telescopes that are over there. You can't get onto the site, but you can see them. And the reason I like that one is there's one telescope up there 
that because the debris is moving or the space objects are moving so fast, the dome of telescopes sometimes has a hard time keeping up. You know, they're made for astronomy objects, which are moving a lot slower in the sky. And so what this telescope did instead is it took the entire dome and just brought the whole dome down. So this telescope can go lower than horizon to lower than horizon and track a space object the whole time. And it's just such a cool use of engineering. And plus, it's really kind of creepy at night when you look up and there's this telescope just pointed at you, even though it's not looking at you, you know, it's looking at something else. But it's just a really cool scope. Um, and then my final one is actually not in operation anymore, but it's called a liquid mirror telescope. Mm -hmm. And it used this really cool technology of mercury. And what it did is it would, it was only, it could only point up obviously, cause it had a liquid as the mirror and it would spin up the mirror and the mercury would spread out and it would make this really, it would make a, um, a cleaner glass than actually the glass, they could get the glass. Um, and so that was a great, a telescope for observing things that were going directly overhead. So that was a really good survey telescope because you couldn't track with that one. You could only just count objects, but it was really cool to watch it spin up and then go out into this plane. And then, and all I had to do was clean it was just de-spin it and scrape off the top and then go again. Yeah, I was, I was just about to ask you if you actually got to see it in person, the, the spinning up and then having it be super clear. Yeah, oh. it's really crazy. And they have these safety wires around, you know, and you, you're, you're wearing a mask because you know, some oh, of the mercury. fumes from the, from the mercury is not as healthy. Um, but yeah, it's really amazing. And how, how clear it is and, and the picture, you know, it's, it's actually a view you don't normally get of the mirror of a telescope. Because once you have the mirror on a telescope, it's usually encased in this whole thing because it's moving around, right? Well, that one wasn't moving. And so you could just see the liquid mercury just down there spinning and super cool and also was the stargazing up in the mountains and in Hawaii and in Chile like a lot different just because altitude and less lights yeah it's it's phenomenal in, in Chile they have really done a great job the government has understood that they have these great astronomical sites and so all of the towns that are near these observatories have different kind of lights so that it keeps the ambient light down for the observatories which is great really really awesome um, but yeah, the thing in the Southern hemisphere though, I learned all my constellations in the Northern hemisphere and, oh. and they're upside down when you go in the Southern hemisphere. So I would often find myself, I would go outside and then I would have to turn my head upside down. I'm like, okay, now I got it. Um, but yeah, I mean, cause you have to go outside to see for optical observations. You have to make sure there's none of those like hazy clouds, um, that are ruining your observations. So we would go outside a lot and do a lot of observing. The altitude on Haleakala wasn't actually that much of a problem. It's high, but it's not ridiculously high. Um, on Mauna Kea, where we did some observations, that's at 14,000 feet. And um, so you, you live at 10,000 feet and you drive up that final 14,000 or that final 4,000 each day. And there we had a rule, no decisions are made at the mountain because your decision-making skills aren't super great and you can really make it even if the observing is going poorly you just finish out the night and then come down to alt, you know 10,000 feet and make a decision Chile was about the same height as um it's not quite as high so we just lived right next to the observatories oh yeah I was going to ask about that because I did a just a you know a few hours tour of Mount Kea, and uh -huh. it's, it just feels like not not great just being up there and it's super cold and the air is just like pretty it's like thin so yeah, yeah. I was kind of wondering about that and also um, kind of the difference in optical telescopes when you're at sea level versus up there. Can you get, is there a notable difference of kind of uncertainty that you have a lot less uncertainty when you're up high? So yeah, what you have is less um, of the atmosphere to go through. Mm -hmm. So you get rid of a lot of the atmospheric attenuation problems that you have down in orbit. So any of the light that's coming through on, you know, similar to what it does to the sun, um, any light that's coming from that spacecraft and that reflected spacecraft light is going to get attenuated and, and absorbed. Some of it might get absorbed by the atmosphere. And so um, the higher up you can go, the more out of that atmosphere you can do, the better off it is for observations. And so that's why observatories are usually at altitude, because mm -hmm. you're trying to get above as much of the um, atmospheric issues as possible. Um, so Chile was like that. 
Um, and the drier air is better, right? So you have fewer water particles, that's always better. So there's certain sites that actually work a lot better for that. Um, so normally you don't have observatories at sea level and, right. but sometimes you do. So like ours, about, at ours at Cal Poly is at sea level, but yeah. <laughs> and surrounded by campus lights. <laughs> <laughs> Not great conditions. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm wondering about in-space observation because um, so there hasn't been any dedicated orbital debris I get from at the time of your thesis from what I read, um, but there was one that did do some observations in infrared if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. aside from no atmosphere, are there other advantages of doing in-space observations of the orbital space debris? Yeah, there is. It's uh, one of the big advantages is that you can get more of the orbital arc like we were talking oh, about. Okay. So you, you can have many more observations. Um, the con to it, though, is you're also now moving. Um, and that sometimes can work in your favor because you get if you're moving almost at the same rate that the other one is, it almost looks like you're not moving. Right. So I keep going back to car analogies, but it's similar on the freeway. You can both be going 70 miles an hour, but if you look over at the car next to you, it seems like you're not moving at all because comparatively to each other. And it's the same in space. So if you're going about the same speed as that other space object, you get a longer observation because you're going by it much slower. And But you also have to remember you're now a moving object. So you have to know your position really well or you can't get the position of the other object very well. So would the only solution to that be GPS as far as kind of accuracy of your own precision? Because anything That's else the solution we have right now. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would go as far as say the only solution, but it's a pretty good one. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to have the ability to rotate your spacecraft so that your sensor can be facing whatever object that you're observing. Where most of the time spacecraft sensors are focused on like pointing down to the earth and that's what you have to keep it moving towards. Now you're talking about, oh, there's an object over there or there's an object over there and you've got to be able to have enough to be able to move to track those objects. Okay, yeah. some interesting attitude control requirements. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm wondering then also the wavelength of observing up in space because that spacecraft, I forgot what the name was, but did it in SPX. infrared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, well, because I know that Earth also gives off IR. So would there be, or is that not that much interference or would there be a wavelength that would be ideal for doing that if you could pick? Yeah, it depends what you're trying to do, right? So there are different wavelengths that are better for other things. So if you're trying to figure out what kind of fuel a spacecraft is using, you can look at the IR gives off a better answer for that because it'll have very significant signatures in the IR. If you're trying to figure out temperature of spacecraft, IR is the right way to go because you can. That's that's the right way in comparing those. For trying to determine material types, the far infrared is not helpful for us. We we tend to look. There's some near infrared wavelengths that optically we look at that can show difference in material types, and then optically um, materials look differently optically and then right at the beginning or the end part of the ultraviolet. So we usually range from about 0.3 to about three microns um, so that uh, you, you can see certain features for material identification. So yes, your answer to that question is yes, it's absolutely important you know what you're trying to observe and so that you can be set up with the right materials and the right um, sensors. So I want to go on to orbit determination since you yeah. can get different data from the radar versus the optical. Okay. So from, from the radar, I guess we can start with Lambert's problem, which would be the simplest way to do it. Um, not statistical, but to get an orbit from that. So, yeah. and that would come from the radar could give you the actual precision vector since you have range and range rate. Right. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so basically Lambert's problem is you have two positions and you know you observed it here with this position and observed it here with this position and you know the time in between those observations, you can get a velocity vector from those two. So that is the simplest way to do orbit determination, um, which is interesting because if you ask my students when they first get introduced to Lambert's, they would say it's not simple. Um, <laughs> but very quickly you start to realize that it is simple and the inputs are great. The hard parts about it, though, is some of the assumptions you have to make for that are what we call linear assumption. 
So the time in between those steps, you're assuming it's a straight line. Um, Lambert's doesn't um, help you figure out like a curvature really, but because of the universal variable part in there, there's a linear assumption. So the time step really needs to be short for a better accuracy of those two steps. Um, so we, we can start with Lambert's as an initial orbit determination problem. And then for the optical, since you can't get a rate, you have the angles only. So can you talk about just different methods of determining orbits just from having the angle of like, uh, what's it called? Declination and azimuth? Yeah, so it's right ascension right and declination. Right ascension and declination. <laughs> yeah, you've got, you got one of each. So they're either right <laughs> yeah. ascension and declination or azimuth and elevation. Oh, okay. So um, azimuth and elevation is usually given to you from an observer. It's It's how high up you are from the surface and, and then north, south, east, and west. Mm -hmm. Right ascension and declination, the way I kind of describe it is it's like latitude and longitude, but on the sky. So it's a whole sky thing. Um, and so that's saying to you, if you point your telescope at that right ascension and declination, you will find the object in the sky. So what happens is we can get those observations from an optical sensor, because if I take a picture, and usually we do that with um, CCD cameras on telescopes. If I take a picture, I get, um, and depending on like, as you mentioned before, the pixel location, I can say, hey, this object was in this pixel location. I have a known star that was in this pixel location. It has a specific right ascension and declination. So I know that my, I can come back over and figure out exactly where that space object was for the right ascension and declination for that frame. Mm -hmm. And then you do that for every single frame. And so you get hopefully at least three, that's the minimum that you need are three sets of right ascension and declination and time. And um, the reason you need three is because there's six degrees of freedom in the position and state vector. There's three terms of velocity and three terms in um, position. And so you need three sets of two angles in order to get that six degrees. So as then what you can do is figure out ways to combine those to try and figure out what the actual orbital path is in between. And so that's really the initial orbit determination. And there's different methods to do that. There's, you know, method, and it's all based on observations of planets early on. A lot of these aren't brand new things, you know, one's called Gauss because it's named after Gauss because he discovered it, you know, so these are um, not 19, hundred uh, you know not even 1900s as far as how you're they're calculating these um positions for orbit determination because it really stems from planetary and comet research mm -hmm. so another big part of the orbital problem is if say you can know an orbit pretty well but then that orbit's going to change over time yeah. so can you give just a brief overview of the evolve and then the, the ordem 96 um programs at nasa that you used in order to do that kind of how is this orbit changing Right. So in the end of the modeling tools that NASA uses, you know, they what they're trying to give you is an idea of what the debris environment's going to be like throughout the lifetime of your spacecraft's time frame in space. So what they kind of look at is they have a breakup model involved in there. So they assume there's going to be X number of breakups by objects or collisions or things like that to try and simulate that environment as well. Um, my part in those models was trying to determine what the current environment was. So I was doing the optical observations to determine that. We had a radar part that was all giving in, in data into that. In order to, to propagate forward and figure out what the orbits are going to be like in 10 years, you have to know what they are first. Mm -hmm. So that's where our, my part was. And then they would take these models and propagate them forward. What you have, like you mentioned, is perturbational effects. So in LEO, you have drag, you have solar radiation pressure, you have the fact that the Earth isn't actually a sphere, even though we keep saying it's a sphere. It's not flat, <laughs> but it's not a perfect sphere. And, um, and so it's got these undulations all over it. Uh, and uh, so you have to account for that. Um, and then you have to account for the fact that there's different things in the solar system that are also pulling on your object, you know, like the sun and the moon and Jupiter. And so all of the, that goes into perturbing that orbit. So you put all of those in and then you propagate all of those objects forward with all of the perturbational effects and you try and see what your environment is like five years from now. So would it be accurate to say, yeah, would it be accurate to say that 
the kind of if you wanted to create as much debris as humanly possible as fast as possible you do an anti-satellite test yeah that's what you would yeah. do if you were um a few countries that are no yeah. longer allowed to be mentioned in my house <laughs> so. <laughs> well i guess the u.s is guilty too if i remember correctly the u.s so. is just as guilty and, but for different reasons and mm -hmm. i feel like the one difference and I don't want to get political, but the difference that we have in the United States is our scientists are allowed to scream and yell when we do stupid things as a, and, oh, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's slightly different than the other two countries that have done this. And especially Russia more recently, you know, the Chinese did it in 2008, seven, seven, 2007. And the world just kind of went like the scientists in this, our debris community went what is happening? <laughs> you know, like we're not in the cold war anymore. This was not in our eyes, something that needed to happen. And, you know, it created something like 3,500 more pieces in one minute mm -hmm. than and unnecessary and in an altitude that those things aren't going to come down very quickly. And that was the tracked pieces. That's not even the pieces we can't see. So, um, we thought we, we had kind of solved this problem and then to have Russia just do it again, two weeks ago felt like, did we not learn anything <laughs> from the last time? But I feel like that's slightly differently. And, and I know that the government and the scientists don't always agree. And I would imagine that the Russian scientists on the orbital debris side are really frustrated right now because they have to know this was not the smart decision, but yeah, never mind. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave the rest of it to, you know, sometimes Governments don't make the right science decision on things. Makes sense. So I also want to know, or kind of getting into your work for your PhD, kind of the importance of knowing the material type of what is actually out there, because it's one thing doing all these observations, you just have some object, but then as far as how that orbit is going to change over time, it's important to know the material of the object. Right. And so really what we're trying to do initially for the material type was even less of a bigger thing than that. What we were trying to do is say, hey, we have this range where, and we talked about shielding in the beginning of all of this, but we can shield up to about one centimeter and we can observe really well to 10 centimeters in diameter. And that's a big range, one centimeter to 10 centimeters that you can't maneuver away from it because you don't know where it is and you can't shield against it. It's gonna come right through. So because of that fact, what I was trying to do initially was can I figure out the material type in some of these highly populated regimes so that we could shield against more of the specific material type instead of doing generic shielding for all material types? You know, could I, could we actually make a shield that was better for paint than steel? You know, I, I we were just going to try and figure it out. The other thing is when you don't know the orbit very well of the object, we have to assume it has a certain albedo to figure out how big it is. And albedo just means like how much it's reflecting light. And so right now we assume a really, really, really dark albedo because that's what fits all the models. And my thought process was, well, if I can figure out more of the material type, maybe we're actually underestimating the size of these objects that we're getting because we're underestimating the albedo and they're actually bigger than we think. And so, or smaller than we think, maybe we're going the wrong way with albedo, I don't know. So. That was the idea initially. Now what we're thinking of is you can use this to help you with health of the spacecraft because if your material looks different than you are expecting it to be, that's we did that with some GPS um, contamination that was happening on their solar cells. Um, or could it be identifying materials like we did with the upper stage of the Apollo that they thought was an asteroid and then we observed it spectrally and it turned out it was titanium paint and so that's obviously not an asteroid anymore so um we were able to identify it as this Apollo upper stage so um and then what you can also do is look at okay how is that going to do perturbations long-term effect the space and identify the space environmental effects um, on orbit as well as on the ground and try and marry those kind of two observations. Wait, was the contamination on those GPS, on that GPS satellite, was yeah. that like actual contamination of like maybe it's thrusters or was it more degradation? It, both. Um, okay. What they were seeing is actually um, more because they have um, collector plates on their solar cells, on their solar panels, um, you know, so they have these, 
I don't, I don't have a, <laughs> I'd like to show things with my hands, which makes it really hard, but mm -hmm. um, so you have a regular solar panel and then you'll have side panels that are oriented in a certain spot that will reflect sunlight onto the panels, mm -hmm. but maybe your orientation of your panels isn't great. And so what we were seeing actually is those collector plates were putting contamination or collecting contamination differently than the others and they weren't producing what they thought they were doing and so what we were able to see is that those side plates looked different than the than the main plate and then that's where they figured out where the contamination was coming from in that case if i remember correctly i think it was a glue that they were using was different on the collector plates than it was on the panels um, but yeah from thrust there's contamination everywhere um, okay. it can come from thruster firings it can come from stuff thumbing off it can come from general outgassing um there's a lot of different places that contamination can come from can we get into the spectroscopy side so can yeah. you go over kind of just some fundamentals like what is spectroscopy and how you can use it to identify a material sure so every material absorbs and reflects light differently and so the, what we use for spectroscopy is i look at the reflectance signal from an object. So right now I'm wearing a green jacket. You're wearing a black shirt. If I used a spectrometer and I looked at the light coming off of my jacket, I would see an absorption feature that was looked like it was green. Yours would have an absorption feature that would look like it's black. Mm -hmm. um, so every material, no matter what, will have a different set of features. And so the idea for spectroscopy is to look at the spacecraft and that you can determine what's on the materials. So the good thing with spacecraft, though, is when you come, unlike um, asteroids, when you combine elements in nature's world, it becomes a new element. Mm -hmm. Luckily, that doesn't happen with spacecraft. If you have aluminum and you have aluminum and white paint, you don't get aluminum paint. <laughs> you know, you have some percentage of aluminum and some percentage of white paint. So what we can do on spacecraft is what we say linear com linearly combine them. So I can look at a spectrum that I get from a remote sample that I've collected from the ground. And I can say, okay, that feature looks like an aluminum feature. This thing looks like it's about 35% aluminum. Oh, that feature's from white paint. Let's put a little bit of white paint in there. And then, oh, I see some organic material like capped on. And so we can put that. And so we can start to put together what we think the surface was made from due to those spectral features. And is that also a function of the source of the light? Because say, if our sun was more red or something, would then that look different? Or is it just on the material because it's about absorption? It's about absorption, but we do have light that comes at different energy levels. You know, that's why the sun looks that yellow color, because that's the wavelength in which it's putting out the most light. And so, yeah, what we do is we actually divide out by the solar spectrum so that the spectrum that I see that I look at is only being reflected by what's being absorbed by the object, not what's being absorbed by the atmosphere or, it, but I do look at what's happening. So I look at a star that's like the sun in my same frame that I take for remote, I'll take one right after that. And I see what the atmosphere is absorbing as well. And I try and remove that. And then I make sure that I have a comparison for when I do lab data, I have something that's emitting light similar in similar wavelengths to the, to the sun. So I get the same percentages. Because if the sun put out a lot more red light than yellow light, you, you would have a different spectrum because the yellow section would be lower in its absorption because it doesn't have enough of it to absorb. So is the kind of most... I guess, annoying or kind of in the way part of the atmosphere, the water, or is there other kind of elements in the atmosphere that also make it kind of difficult and have some oh, dead bands? The water. Okay. <laughs> there are um, water features at 1.6 microns and 1.7 and 2.1, I think, if I remember correctly. It's just areas that I don't even look at. You know, mm -hmm. um, we move and look at a region of one point high 1.7s to, to 1.9 and then I move off into the 2.1 um, to 2.3 micron range so I get out of the water band um, just because you can try and divide out as much as you can but if your observatory that's why we try and be in dry places to do mm -hmm. this so you're trying and you wouldn't want to do this kind of work when you're sitting at sea level in 
you know, the south of the U.S. because you're going to get water. You're not going to be able to ever get rid of all the water features. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's definitely the water (laughs) and being on the surface of the earth. Yeah. (laughs) If I could be, you know, just sit with James Webb for the rest of the time, that would be a great spot to be, throw my spectrometer out. (laughs) Are those water dead bands, would they be kind of useful to look at if like from a space-based kind of observation? Yeah, they would because there's water in a lot of spacecraft um, materials, right? I mean, that's the idea that you'd have hydrogen and oxygen in those materials makes sense, you know, Mm. and especially in the organics. And so we do have features in in those regions, but you just can't delineate those from other things because you're never 100% sure you got all of the water out Mm. from the atmosphere. Can you talk about the uh, the Odorax missions? Because those were interesting. I hadn't heard of those before. So yeah, just kind of overall, kind of what that was for calibration. Yeah, so the Odorax missions um, were small spheres. Um, we, <laughs> we jokingly called them bowling for astronauts um, because basically these spheres, we sent them out of the shuttle and they became, we knew everything about the sphere. We knew the size, the shape, the external material. We knew the mass. Um, and so what we were able to do is based on the radar optical um, signal back from it, we could calibrate the radar signal correctly and we could calibrate the optical signal correctly based solely on these spheres because we knew exactly what they were supposed to be and, and look like. And so that's unlike when you're trying to observe any other spacecraft because you didn't get to measure it before it left. You didn't get to, you don't know the mass. And they were, since they were spheres, that whole issue of attitude, you know, so if you're looking at something that's boxy, you don't really know when you're observing it what side you're looking at, but with a sphere, it doesn't matter, right? You're always going to be looking at a sphere. So they were awesome um, calibration type missions um, and super cool because of the altitude they were able to go at. So we were able to look at it with radar and obviously with optical then too, and um, with known information we it was our really our first chance to be able to say okay this is what it should look like as a radar for this material for this size and so it allows you to really calibrate the whole system yeah so i'm wondering about the glare because from the spheres then you don't get that specific if a box is oriented in just the right way the light could reflect like just any other glare like off a building right. um can you account for that or like how would you account for that say an optical if something just looks really bright all of a sudden, I guess, can you kind of figure it out? Well, um, as one of my uh, colleagues used to say, John Africano, you need more data, more mm-hmm. data. That's what he would say all the time. So you, if you get a weird glint like that, your antenna should go up and, and your brain should be saying, I need to go observe that again. And so if you don't see that glare again or that glint again, then that tells you it's there was something that you caught on the side of that spacecraft that made it look bigger. What really usually happens is that glint comes off periodically and you can see it on the variation of light that's coming from it. You can start to see how it's rotating. Um, If it's spinning or if it's three axis stabilized, you can start to see that, but you have to observe it a lot more than just send the radar signal up and have it come back down or look at it for even 15 minutes of its orbit as it passes over your head you have to look at it a lot because any different time of observation, it could have a different orientation to you where the sun is. So what we call phase angle, it could have a different look like that. And you could be seeing a different attitude side of it. So you have to observe it a lot to be able to figure out if that glint was a normal thing. Was it, if you saw it the first time and it glinted like that, but you never saw it go back down. Is it that big? Is it, that it's just putting off that much, it's reflecting that much light, or is it some small part that you, like you were saying, you've got the exact right angle and the light came right back to you, like solar panels. They do that a lot. Does it matter for spectroscopy since they would have the same absorption bands or just be higher intensity? It does, and it goes back to the exposure time. So Uh we set the exposure time for that sensor expecting it to be a certain level. So when things glint, it overexposes the image and you can't see any of the absorption features because it it goes up too high. It just gets saturated then? It gets saturated. Okay. 
So unfortunately, unless the glint doesn't saturate and that's, that's helpful, but usually, um, usually the glint is, you know, cause most things don't glint like that. And so usually mm -hmm. you set the exposure time, assuming the thing's not going to glint. And, um, when it does, it saturates and that frame, unfortunately gets put on the cutting room floor because you can't get anything from it. So then also you could see different kind of between two observations of the same spacecraft, you're looking at different sides, you could actually see just a different signature because it's different materials too. Yep. So it's the same thing, just get more data. on More the... data, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, astronomy is like that too. It's just the, the realm of observations. You, you can't tell a lot from one, one time observing something. And the Department of Defense does that with orbits too. You know, they observe these objects every couple of days because things are changing. And so because of that fact, it's just more data. You just have to continually look, which is great for people like me, because I like to look. So <laughs> being able to have the excuse to look <laughs> is always helpful. Can you talk about the, the three regions that you looked at? Um as far as in your PhD thesis, I haven't written yeah. down uh, for the specific microns because I'm not sure if you remember the exact ones, but yeah, kind of what you can tell from each one and how those can help characterize or be able to see it's this material. Yeah, so the first one we looked at, um, which I, my thesis, I think I called region one and it's really just the visible region. Okay. So it's where your eye can actually tell things, you know, that mm -hmm. your eye is in region one basically. And um, what you can tell from there is color. Um, there are materials like aluminum that have specific absorption features in a realm in the visible regime that other metals don't, like steel and um, columbium or anything like that that they, titanium, things like that that they might fly. So you can discern different metals from each other through that region, and you definitely can discern color. So if you have something that's gold or you have something, you know, like Kapton, or you have something like white paint, or you have something that's really dark, you can tell the difference between them. Um, as you go into the near infrared, which is region two and region three, those have different absorption features based on the different organic material. So um, they mostly have what's called CH, which is a high, hydroxyl or carbon and hydrogen together. So it's a CH and depending on what it's with, it will make it have different absorption features at different locations or different depths of absorption features. So the near infrared allows you, and, and metals will have nothing, right? They have no absorption features. So right away, you tell the difference between a metal and an organic like paint or something like that, or um, foam or anything like that. Then now you look at the specific shape and size of those absorption features, and then you can tell the difference between paint and you can tell the difference between Kapton and Kevlar and flexible materials and, and the different types of materials you might have that are more organic based um, that may have the same color. So you couldn't discern them in the visible regime, but now you can discern them because you're in the infrared. Unfortunately, sensors don't work that way most of the time unless you have a spectrometer that goes this whole round. So usually what happens is we get filter regions. So you will get say, some region in the visible. Some telescopes only have blue region and red regions that you can compare. Um, other telescopes, like the ones on Mauna Kea that I use, they did have the infrared regions, but you wouldn't get the visible at the same time. You'd only get the infrared. Mm. So unless you have a full spectrometer like that on your telescope, which isn't very often, it's usually in segments. Um, so. so is that, do telescopes not work that they collect some light and you can interchange filters. Is that just not how it works at all? You can interchange filters, but it takes a bit to interchange filters, right? Okay. So if you're thinking about you only have the pass for 10 minutes, you have to think about the time it takes for the telescope to switch filters. So the telescopes mm -hmm. on, on Mauna Kea might switch filters, but you have to think about, okay, if that takes a minute to switch the filter, am I going to lose my pass, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you, ha you have to think about it. So oftentimes we would stay on one filter all night and then the next night do the next filter. And sometimes you wouldn't see the same object again. You just had to make observing calls like that um, before you went and think about what your end goal was for that observing run. Mm 
For the Apollo body that ended up having, I think you said titanium. Yeah, titanium based um, white paint, yeah. Had you tested that before in a lab or did you see a spectrum and then go and figure out? No, we've seen it in the lab because it was pretty, um, you know, I got all my materials from Johnson Space Center. And so they had a lot of, they had a lot of old materials, let's just say. And I got to test a lot of the things that went up on LDEF and a lot of the things that were just on general spacecraft. Um, and so I had a similar, I didn't probably have the exact kind of, of white paint uh, that they used on Apollo, but I had a close enough one um, that when I saw the absorption features, it, it was an organic paint. I knew that for sure because of just the way the features looked like. And then we were able to match um, pretty well in that, in the, mostly in the near infrared. We had a hard time that we didn't go down far enough to get um, a white. And it's probably not white anymore, actually, due to the space environments. And that Apollo was on a huge heliocentric orbit. So it spent a lot of time really close to the sun. So I would imagine it's not white anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't get that far down into the visible ring to tell that. But we could tell it based on absorption features due to the organics in the paint. Have you gotten to a point where you've tested so many materials and seen the spectrum that you can kind of, oh, that's that? Well, um, one of my thesis advisors, Roger Clark, he is like the guru of spectroscopy and he can do that. Um, and actually I got to show him some, it was like my crowning moment of my PhD is because I got to show him some that he had never seen before because he didn't look at spacecraft material. You know, he actually works for um, the US Geological Society. So he has all of the earth-based materials down, but some of the spacecraft ones he hadn't seen before, you know, so specific spacecraft materials, he was like, oh, that's so cool, you know. Um, I got that way a lot with my PhD. It's, um, so if it's a single material, I can usually have a good idea if it looks right or it doesn't look right. Um, but when it starts to combine materials, it starts to get harder for me because I'm like, okay, that looks like it could be this, but you can't tell definitively until you start to combine things together. But there are specific, I, if I see something that has the aluminum feature, I, you can point that out pretty quickly because um, it's just different than everything else. I'm wondering about the absorptions that it's, they give off light based on energy that electrons are collecting or giving off when they move down an orbital. Yeah. Is there any way to make some kind of an argument where you should have an idea of this is what a material spectroscopy should look like based on energy levels, or is it kind of you can only know empirically? That's a great question. Um, ideally, I think on the molecular level, you should be able to say that, right? But then each material, especially in spaceflight, could possibly have something slightly different in it. So I think material-based and material-based, it's just easier to go through and measure it in the yeah. lab than it is to chemically try and manufacture that, that material. So I don't go down to, that means there's this many electrons in this, in this ring and that ring. You know, I'm looking at the overall big, bigger picture. So for me, it's better to, to have this laboratory thing that looks at that bigger picture at that level. Um, instead of trying to become a materials engineer, you know, which is probably where they, where they would lie at, but they don't want to look at the whole big picture of, of why that's important for spacecraft. Yeah, I was thinking that because also it's not just one wavelength, it's just like the entire spectrum of wavelengths. So I wouldn't know yeah. if there's any way to determine that. Yeah, that's um, a good question. I actually don't know that. So there's also the space environment. So like the, as you said, the spacecraft isn't going to look the same as when it launched. So you yeah. can, can kind of talk about how materials will change over time throughout the years at being in space? Yeah, so when we teach it, we talk a lot about beginning of life and end of life. So you're gonna have this pristine spacecraft at the beginning of life and you've sized things like a radiator that helps get rid of a temperature inside. And this radiator has a property of say aluminum on the outside and you're expecting this aluminum to radiate temperature in this kind of fashion at the beginning of life. But what we really have to do is have you measure it for what you think it's going to do at the end of life, because you need to make sure it's still doing the job you need it to. So if it's for temperature control and say I have this aluminum, I need to know how that aluminum is going to change its property. And so or white paint, because white's kind of easier for people to picture. So if you need white paint um, and you have a white shirt on, say, you know, it's reflecting all of the light. 
And so you don't get hot when usually when you're wearing something white. When you're wearing something dark, it like our dark hair, you know, our hair gets really hot <laughs> summertime because it's just absorbing all that heat. And so you would want something kind of white on the surface of your spacecraft to reflect heat off of your spacecraft if that was what your thermal issue was. But now if that white paint is not white at the end of your life, it's kind of brown. That brown is now going to absorb more wavelengths and actually increase the temperature of your spacecraft. And that's not maybe not what you want to do. So what you want to do is figure out how these materials are going to change over its lifetime and do your calculations based on the end of life so that at the end of its life of its mission, it's still working in the way you think it should. Even And so that might mean you make it bigger at the beginning and you oversize things at the beginning so that it's working better than you need it to at the beginning so that by the end of life and the way materials age, it's still working at the end of its life to the specifications that you need. And then as far as observing, I think if I remember correctly that they're actually, even though it looks different from the spectral signature, it remained relatively the same. Yeah, so the spectral signature can change. And what we've tried to do is look at it, what it's gonna change is in color. It'll absolutely change in the visible regime. We've seen that. Mm -hmm. um, the organic aspect seems to not change quite as much because what the space environment is probably going to do is eat away at the surface. And so you're still going to have that material in there. You're just not going to have as much of it. And so the, the infrared signature stays um, relatively the same, but the visible signature tends to change. If say there was a piece of space debris that was aluminum, but was covered in Kapton, Mm -hmm. and you only saw the Kapton side from Earth, would you be able to identify it as that or would it just look like Kapton? Yeah, see, that's a great question because it depends on the wavelength in which you look at it. So the wavelength can actually go, we, and we talked about this a little bit with the radiation, depending on the wavelengths of, of, of light, it can penetrate through the top layer or the top surface and you can see the underlying surfaces. So that's why spectroscopy is helpful because you get more wavelengths of data and you can start to see what's underlying, depending on how thick that Kapton is. Now, if it's just Kapton, like the Kapton you can see through, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to see the aluminum. If okay. it's a Kapton layer on the exterior surface of an MLI blanket, a multi-layer insulation blanket, you're not going to see the underlying aluminum because it's an inch thick of <laughs> a blanket material. You're not going to get a wavelength through them. Can you talk about the part where I, I think if I remember correctly, you thought initially that organic, that the organic paints would be degraded with the space environment, but later found out that it was more so flaking yeah. than degrading. So can you talk a little bit about that, kind of how you found that? Yeah. So really what that came from is on the LDF sample, um, you know, when looking at the side that was facing the ram direction and comparing it to the other side, what we saw was a mass loss from the atomic oxygen because it was eating away at the material. But spectrally, that material looked the same as the white that was on the back. So I wasn't, what you're not able to tell with spectroscopy is the eating away of materials like atomic oxygen, unless it does change the color or the surface properties, then I can see that, but I can't tell mass loss with spectroscopy. And so I can tell what the material is. And then if you can combine it with what you know with that material based on atomic oxygen testing done on the ground, you can kind of start to determine mass loss. But that is the one thing with spectroscopy and material and health. I can't tell you when it's gonna eat away until it gets to the point that I can suddenly see different material. And then I'm like, ah, <laughs> your, your, MI, uh, your layer isn't there anymore because suddenly I'm seeing substrate instead of blanket material yeah so would any satellite operators be interested in that kind of information coming from spectroscopy or would they yeah. more want to be able to figure that out like is there a market for that at all you think yeah i always thought there would be and um, you know to be able to tell health of your spacecraft i think the one hard part is there's a lot going on like we mentioned before about what attitude it's showing you'd have to get a lot of data on a specific spacecraft to really determine the health based solely on spectroscopy. And usually when spectroscopy is helpful is in the cases like the GPS thing where they already knew there was something wrong with the health 
And we were just trying to see a difference between one part of the spacecraft spectrally to the other part of the spacecraft that were supposed to agree and they didn't. Um, and so that's where the advantage would come in. I think though, um, like I said, you'd have to get so much data for the operator to be able to tell health. I think what's more helpful for spectroscopy is really on the, the debris side of being able to more accurately determine like albedo and shielding. I think that's where the spectroscopy part is going to be helpful. Um, whereas when you do it on, on natural objects like asteroids and meteoroids and, and comets, like that's actually helpful because then it's going to, what it's made of, that will tell you about like what it's going to do when it comes in contact with our atmosphere. You know, is it going to be mm -hmm. able to burn up? Is it not? You know, and then by that material, they can kind of look at albedo and figure out size. So I think it's more helpful for them as that point of knowing materials than it would be for a spacecraft person. But I would love to know the spacecraft health through spectroscopy mm -hmm. <laughs> of all my spacecraft, but unfortunately they haven't, I haven't made my own and launched it yet. <laughs> <laughs> when I do though. <laughs> So I think that's pretty much all I had for questions as except for, I think I remember once that you said like when you're working on your PhD, uh -huh. um, at some point you're like four or five years in, you're, you're like, I kind of want to be done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So how was that? That was that whole story of kind of going through the PhD process. The PhD process is um, a, a massive test of perseverance. Um, it is, it is a lot of individual time. Um, and it, it, I personally believe you really have to like what you do to start because which usually by the end, you're like, okay, come on, let's, <laughs> let's just go. Um, because it could be four or five, six years of studying one thing. And really what you're trying to do is become the, the single expert in that one thing. And my mom has her education doctorate and she used to describe it as a blade of grass. And you're basically becoming an expert in one of those roots. Like th that's what you are, not even just the blade of grass, like even farther down than that. And I think that actually describes it really well because that's what you're doing. And in order to do that, it's a lot of time. And I remember at one point I woke up and I thought, I think I've, I'm close to being finished. And my advisor said at one point, when you think you're close and you come and talk to your advisor, you're not as close as you think. <laughs> it's probably mm -hmm. you think you're a year away and you're really a year and a half away. There's always more time than you think. But I put my head down because I just thought, I know I want to be able to really like this when I finish. And so uh, I, I said to my advisor, I want to finish by May. And he said, I don't know if you're going to make it. I'm like, ah, <laughs> I'm going to make it. And sure enough, I did. And he actually laughed at the end. He said, I saw the look in your eye when you told me you were going to make it. And I thought, oh, she might, <laughs> she might actually make it. So um, I was fortunate in grad school, though, to have a really amazing advisor. He was, you know, super encouraging when I needed it and a super kick in the pants when I needed that, too. And um, I think that's why I was able to get out when I wanted to get out. So. So what, what do you think should go into the decision process, I guess, of someone who's, if you're thinking about, do you want to do it, Pete? Do you like actually want to do it? Right. As far as from, you have to like really enjoy what you're going to study. Yeah. My first thing that I ask people, and I even ask them this before they're going to go into a master's program, is like, why do you want it? Mm -hmm. And usually people are trying to get it because someone else told them that they should get it. And that's not a great reason. You know, depending on who that person is, it's, it's not a great, great reason. And um, because it's going to be a lot of time, the master's program is really difficult as well and time consuming. And so you really have to think about, well, why do I want to get this? And is it going to actually get me further in my goals than what I could do without getting it? For me, whether it was correct assumption or not, in my head, I thought I wanted to work for NASA. And I said, if I'm going to work for NASA, I have to be the best in a field that I can possibly be in because they only take the best, which is correct. But I, I now know <laughs> in hindsight, I probably could have gotten a job with NASA as a bachelor's student or a master's student as well. But I'm so glad I went back and got my PhD that I had that kind of blindness. But I knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to work for NASA and I needed a PhD to be able to work for NASA. And so 
I kind of, like I mentioned at the beginning, fell into my PhD work, but I couldn't have fallen any better. You know, it was a really a great fit for me as far as astronomy and engineering. Um, I think I'm a better engineer because I was astrophysics first, um, because I look at problems differently than a lot of traditional engineers, I feel. Um, and you know, it couldn't have, it couldn't have worked out better for me, but the whole decision and the timeline and, and doing all that, I really think you got to think about it because it, it is a long process and there's a reason not everybody gets one and mm -hmm. it's not because it's too hard. It's because of the perseverance aspect. It's a lot of time mm -hmm. and a lot of time, not making any money. <laughs> so, yeah. You know. Yeah, as opposed to being an engineer, then yeah, they could. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then, if, you know, you think about you're back in the school mode where you're standing in the aisle trying to determine which top ramen you want to eat for that week, because <laughs> that's where your finances lie, you know, mm -hmm. um, compared to you're probably not making that decision as a engineer in the field right now. Right. Hopefully not. If, <laughs> if you're making that decision, you and I had a different, we needed to do some advising. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, one last question as far as getting into Cal Poly. Um, yeah. Yeah, kind of your, your decision process as to, I want to become a professor. Yeah. Um, you know, both of my parents are educators. They both taught at community colleges um, and both retired from teaching at community colleges. So education was always um, paramount in my growing up, you know, my parents didn't care what kind of degree I was going to get, but we were going to get a degree that, that there was not a question on one side. It was only a question of what do you want to study? Um, and I appreciate that aspect that push, you know, of just like, Hey, let's go get this. Let's figure out what you like, but we're going to go get this. Um, and so I, when I was in grad school, I taught quite a bit and I really liked it. And I kind of had it in the back of my head. I'd like to teach someday, but I really want, I mean, I still really wanted to go work for NASA. Like that was the whole reason we did all of this. And so I went to NASA, but I found myself taking more opportunities to go into schools and do outreach about debris or about NASA. Um, you know, I was, I always volunteered to be the guest person to grade people's science experiments because I just liked the education process and watching people get excited about space. Um, and so when my husband and I made a decision to maybe, we were both working at NASA at the time, to maybe try and go and do, live somewhere else um, other than in Houston, Texas, I thought, well, you know, why don't I look into teaching because that's something I always thought I would do. Um, and then I said, hey, why don't we look at Cal Poly? Because um, living in San Luis Obispo would be pretty darn nice. And the school is amazing for aerospace engineering. So let's look at that. And then they had a job and one thing led to another. And I happened to be at the right place at the right time for the position that I got. And I absolutely love teaching. I, I knew I would like it. I didn't understand that I would love it. And uh, it made leaving my dream job at NASA much easier because I've gotten the opportunity now, and I know it sounds super cheesy, but I've gotten the opportunity now to have two dream jobs. And um, a lot of people don't get one. So I feel amazingly fortunate to have two. And teaching at Cal Poly has just been phenomenal. You guys come in and with such, such eyes wide open and sponges and to watch where you are when I get you as freshmen in your first time class to where you graduate from it's it, the process and the growth that you see in collegiate our our college students through aerospace engineering is absolutely phenomenal and then to watch you guys walk in on day one you're contributing to meetings and building spacecraft and and planes and you know it's it's just so cool it is really cool to watch yeah, I could do without the grading of finals yeah. all within two periods of two days. But other than that, I love my job. Okay, well, thank you again yeah. for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I know it's your winter break, taking yeah, some time I, off after grading. You're welcome. Which AIAA book is that behind you? Is that? This is uh, from Richard Batten, the introduction oh. to, wait, do you know this one? I do. Yeah. Yeah. My Yeah, my boss got it for me, this one, and then a few more just... Yeah, just on the astrodynamics side. Batten's yeah. tough to read, though. Yeah, I definitely don't just use, like, I use, like, other sources as well. Because, yeah. like, right now, going to the three-body problem, like, so just some derivations. It's just, like, there's a lot of stuff you skipped, and it's kind of just, like, where did this equation come from? Right. Somewhere. Yeah, augment it with Velado, because Batten and mm -hmm. 
and Chobotov, they're both very, very mathy. Mm-hmm. And it gets, it can, you can get lost in the math and without seeing what the big picture is. Um, yeah, I was wondering if it was Batten or, or Bang Wee also has a book that's on mm-hmm. controls. So I figured it was one of those two that has that same exact cover. So still a good book. And yeah, just very, I, I like visual diagrams, like plots, and there's yeah. not too many in there. Not so. too many. Do you have Velato? No, I don't. I probably should get it though. Yeah, but I, I would try yeah. and find a copy of Velado because I think his, to be honest, it, he's like a rock star in my eyes. If I met him, I'm not sure what I would do. <laughs> I would probably completely freak out. <laughs> but um, his book is really good. And I like how he, he, he writes it as for an engineer, you know, because mm-hmm. it's the application of all of this stuff. You know, he definitely goes through the math, but it's why are we doing this? It's all really applied. I, I, I think it's a good book. Mm-hmm. Okay, I will buy it then. It's worth. <laughs> hey, so yeah. can I, I don't know if you want to turn this off, but I have some questions about you. Yeah, sure. Ask yeah, here I can. I don't know if you 